the second meeting of this year's edition of the Story Tech. With us this afternoon, we are joined by Julie Boots Sorensen, author, scriptwriter, and showrunner for various television series, Tamara Russell, doctor in neuroscience, martial arts expert. She develops new models of collective creation and mindful decision making. Roberto Beneducci from Italy, ethnopsychiatrist and anthropologist, broadens our minds with narratives about, about our identities, affiliations, trajectories, and the painful and traumatic borders we impose on them today. This year, we also wished to invite women and men who live and experience firsthand the impact of narratives on our lives. Their place in our communities put the, puts them at the center of the issues of care and the protection of others. We are honored to have with us Mathilde de, de Lespine, midwife and co-medical director of the Giselle Alimi Women's Center, which just opened Open, yes. a few days ago. And moderating the conversation, director, writer, storyteller, and excellent cook, Nicolas <laughs> Buenaventura, and myself, Yana Perry, writer and not so good cook. Together, we're tackling the question, as the stories of a world in crisis collide with us, how can we conceive stories that reconnect, weave together individual and collective constructs? Can stories heal is our main umbrella question for today, for this afternoon. We're not necessarily looking for answers. We want to explore, to open new windows, and to do that, we will listen to our guests who will take us into the world, the different worlds they are exploring. And in relation to our general question, what narrative for our time? We um, begin with Tamara. You can expose us what you are thinking of, dreaming of, working on right now in that respect. Thank you and delighted to be here today. So I suppose the thing that's been preoccupying me as I engage with the world through the lens that I have, which is neuroscience and martial arts, is trying to think about the conception of a story in terms of, is it a thought? Is it a movement? Is it a mental movement that comes from the imagination? Is it a heart movement that inspires us through feeling and sensing? And the role of the physical body and the physical movements as part of that conceiving of a story. The place where I often come back to, particularly when I'm struck and pained by the state of the world, a collective psychosis, some have referred to it as a madness that we've become trapped in or stuck in, is, again, where does that reside in us as individuals? Because my sense is if we need to curate collective stories, there's a self-responsibility that we first examine our own stories as individuals. So in that movement from I to we, we don't just jump over the I and suddenly go to the we and discover that we're carrying a lot of our own wounds and pains and, and biases with us. And if I think about healing stories and healing journeys, what the martial arts has taught me is there's a lot we can do for our own healing. If you're able to feel into your own wounds, whether those are physical, psychological, or mental. So this idea of being a, a researcher of our own experience through sensing, through touch, allowing us to make contact with our own wounds and pains, which then opens that doorway 
to be more compassionate when we're engaging with the wounds and the pains of others around us. And it's perhaps from that point of where do we suffer together mm -hmm. that we can begin to understand the experience of being in this, in this mad world. Thank you. Roberto, what about this shared suffering? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm uh, very glad to share my, my uh, ideas. And uh, I, I can start uh, by remembering with you uh, when I started to think of these issues, because I think that our concern uh, have a, a place and a time when they born. And my first meeting with this concern was uh, uh, when I uh, started to work uh, with uh, uh, mad people in uh, a peripheric area of my birth town, Naples, and uh, uh, helped my, my master. I entered uh, the forest of different languages and stories. They were mad people, but they were poor men and women too. They were uh, people belonging to a specific cultural tradition, and so and so. And uh, this forest of languages obliged me to make a choice, to resist to the violence of the one language. I think that we have to consider these uh, uh, violence uh, of uh, uh, linguistic uh, hegemony as a danger of our time. If I think of my first past experience, uh, I, uh, I think that people were victim of this linguistic violence when obliged to speak about themselves in the language of psychiatry. I think that this is an example of linguistic terrorism, obliging people to reduce their experience, their multiplicity of languages in, within one dominant language. And this experience uh, was, uh, for me, uh, the first time when I started to question the relationship between my knowledge and the experience of other people. So, uh, to start to answer the, to the question, how, how um, uh, stories, words can heal, mm. uh, I think that we have to put first another question. Are we ready to hear the words of people? Are we read, ready to uh, hear other ways of narrating, time, experience, body, and so on. And when I uh, started to study anthropology and I, I took my PhD and worked in, uh, in West Africa, this experience amplified, became more and more complex because I worked with uh, uh, local healers, working with mental disorders, and uh, for me, this was another forest of languages, symbols, strategies, <laughs> words. Uh, in this case, too, I learned my ignorance, and it was a, an important experience. Healing the harder is not giving, giving them a truth, but co write a truth and co-imagine a story. I think that uh, for our uh, work, for our experiment, this is very important. Of course, uh, the experience realized during my last 28 years with the migrants was for me another bomb, yes. because uh, I was obliged to, uh, again, to re Imagine the way of hearing their truth, their lies, their experience. And uh, uh, if you want uh, 
to uh, summarize these uh, different sensitivity, I think that uh, we have to multiply the language. We have to struggle against the uh, dictature of symbolic, if you want, of, of language itself, because uh, we have to include in our job uh, as clinicians, as uh, scholars, as uh, uh, writers, poets, <coughs> as always, other codes. When we realize this, we are successful. Mm. What narrative is for our time? Mm. Uh, a psychiatrist, uh, Jay Lifton, wrote uh, in the uh, 80s, uh, after uh, the, the nuclear age, that for him it was very difficult teaching and making research. Uh, he wrote, I feel a sort of despair. Mm. We have to recognize that we are in a time of despair. So our responsibility is even more big than in the past. Well, we will return to all of these issues. Um, uh, Julie, you tell us what you're concerned with right now in your work as a storyteller, as a screenwriter, as in the different positions you occupy in that world. Uh, yeah, I would say that um, as a scriptwriter, uh, working with cinema, but mostly with television, I'm trying to find the bridge between these two worlds that are quite different. And uh, there's a question of like how to tell my own stories, but uh, I'm also a part of a big industry, and uh, especially when it comes to television, I'm thinking a lot about like what was the personal motivation for me to write. Uh, Lars von Trier, the Danish director, he said once a movie or a show should be uh, like a pebble in the shoe, and how to 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 put that into uh, to the world of television and keep uh, this idea while being a part of an entertainment industry that uh, in many ways want to get what it already has. Uh, it's like small steps in that. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm juggling this this thing like uh, to make something for a broad audience that still says something um, about society and about some people that uh, the viewer is maybe not that used to to see uh, in fiction or in, in television and cinema. Can you give an example of one of the, the series you wrote? Uh, could exemplify yeah. that. Uh, I'm working on a show which is about, um, I don't know how much I can talk about it, but uh, a Danish-Tunisian family uh, and this thing of being, uh, which I'm a part of myself because my husband is French-Tunisian, uh, this thing of being a, a family with many cultures uh, and how, um, how it is to bring up a kid in, in this and how uh, you can become a victim or, uh, of some prejudices from society. And uh, I think, um, I don't know if it's a new story, but I haven't seen it in like a kind of like a broad show. And so um, I have the story that I want to tell. And of course, then I have a dialogue with uh, my producers about it. But I also have a dialogue about the broadcaster and how to tell the story in a, in a proper way. Um, and. Uh, I think before we came here, we talked about uh, this thing uh, about what television is and, and why people watch so many shows. Um, and I think, especially in Denmark, people are quite addicted to spending their two hours on Netflix every night. And uh, at the same time, you're following characters and you're engaged in their lives. I think that is a great opportunity to learn something uh, and feel empathetic about some fictitious characters. But I don't feel that it always have that effect on people. Actually, it can have the opposite effect of pe people, including myself, sometimes becoming almost antisocial, preferring the world of fiction also because it resonates with your world view, the worldview you already have. So how can that be challenged? I think there's a potential. I'm definitely hopeful about it. Uh, but, but right now, um, maybe there's not that many initiatives to 
or maybe I'm not watching those shows that do it, to challenge uh, the spectator or viewer's world vision. Um, also because there's a certain grammar that I think we, it's a bit difficult to not work with it because we work in groups, we work in writers' rooms and we have to have a common language and we're taught a certain way in school with a grammar of like, it's kind of, well, it's back to Aristotle, but also American tradition of like how to tell a story uh, in a film with turning points and point of no return and this. And uh, they're good as crutches, but they, if they become determining of the story, like you begin there, uh, it's a big problem because you will always know where the story is going. But also it's a comfort for the viewer to watch a story where you know it's going, so how do you... You have to make the viewer feel safe at the same time, somehow. So, yeah. Okay, wonderful. So uh, here we, uh, we seem to have mapped out all, enough material for about six weeks of intense conversation. But I would maybe first return to um, what uh, Roberto was saying, and maybe if you could tell us a bit more in your ample research how you came to um, and how you do distinguish on a daily basis working with people from other countries who arrive in states of absolute despair or mental uh, distress, how you distinguish between the language of power, because there's the language of power you're confronted to, or the languages of power, the administration, psychiatry, and this and this and that, and the language and the discourse and the stories of the powerless or the speechlessness of the powerless. Um, could you say something along those lines? This is a strong question, thank you, because uh, uh, first of all, we have to recognize uh, the color of our words. Sometimes we uh, forget that there is a racial, racial uh, profile of our languages. Our languages are racialized but we forget this. And people, when speak about themselves, coming from other countries, have to uh, contain, to struggle against this racialized language. We are unaware. We use this language as normal, but our language has a color. So the first thing to do, to, to recognize, is the fact that uh, in our language, language there are uh, many, many uh, levels, profiles, and if I want to construct, to build another setting, I have to be uh, painfully aware about what my words hide. It is an effort with myself to control my word as well as to control my eyes because even my look can be violent and a powerful look. Second, the powerless language is characterized by uh, its ontological fragility, its ontologically lack of consistency. This is a fact. Many times people speak and the first comment is, I don't understand. Uh, he, she speaks about too many things together. I am a doctor, but uh, she is speaking about uh, her poverty. I am a doctor, but he is speaking about uh, a thing that has no interest for me. People speak as they live. Life is without any consistency. The powerless language is a fragmented language. And this is uh, very important when we uh, meet people uh, with suffering, because in this case, this fragmentation, this lack of consistency is even more uh, important. Consider people that try to explain in another language, not their mother tongue, their strange experience, their delusions, their what we call hallucinations. If you want, I am making an experiment with myself because English is not my mother tongue. And I feel very close to migrant people 
when they try to say all their life in another language. For me, it's important this moment because I feel like them obliged to translate, to translate their body, their gesture in another word. The language of powerless people is a, a shy language, is a, a language characterized by a sort of uh, uh, haunt, uh, as you say, uh, uh, haunting. Haunt, no, no, haunting, no, haunting, shame. 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 I'm sorry, yeah. It is a shameful language, hesitant language. Even when people cry with aggressivity, they are shameful because their cry is a desperation language. I think that we can learn a lot. And a scenario that wants to, to give, to restitute this richness, uh, must to uh, recognize these fragments, uh, reimagining their place and their definition. The cries, the lack of consistency, maybe, is a short cut for a myth, for a cultural perspective, for a cultural memory that we completely ignore. How many times I learned about a past, a cultural past, starting from a cry, from uh, some uh, uh, painful, uh, unspeakable painful experience, but step by step, I enter another world. This means that we need time. Mm. And uh, uh, another disease of our time is the lack of time for hearing people. Again, are we ready to hear other narratives, other stories? This is the challenge. Mm. And for all of you uh, storytellers, this is very interesting, I am joking now. Uh, today, there are many, many story sellers, you know, in migration uh, field, story yes. sellers yes. multiplied. Yes. So we have the multiplication of a story, of a storytelling. If you want, we have to think of a new economy of storytelling. Right. <laughs> maybe you can, thank you. But to, or just, to just say a word, because maybe everybody isn't aware of these story sellers. I wasn't aware of them before I read you. There are these people yeah. whose profession is to sell against money a narrative to the migrant yeah. before he or she stands before... Uh, to be credible. To be credible. To receive the yeah. uh, uh, humanitarian uh, protection and so on. Yeah. It is interesting, but I think that it is a, a new field mm. to, <laughs> to reimagine our way of considering uh, story, epic, narrative, novel, and so on. You should come back to that. Tomorrow, would you want to rebound immediately, or do you, or, or do you want me to ask a question based on what I think you can just go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's the second time Roberto has used that language of, can we really hear? Yeah. Can we really listen? Yes. And I suppose I'm, I'm kind of thinking about the brain uh, from the neuroscience lens, you know, what happens when information, you know, comes in into our brain when we're listening. Very naturally, our, our brain is trying to organize and make sense of that information. And quite quickly, it brings up as many of the experiences that we can connect to as possible, because it's kind of sorting through and trying to make sense, like, do I have an experience of this? Can I connect to this in some way? Um, oh, you know, the I. I don't know if you've ever listened to somebody and they're saying, oh, you know, I went on my holiday uh, to Tenerife. And, and often that first thought that's there is like, oh, I went to Tenerife, <laughs> yeah. right? So we have this natural propensity to try to make sense of that information in relation to our own experience. And that's not wrong or bad, but the awareness of that and the power that, that may come from that, particularly if you're in a hierarchical position as a therapist or as a doctor, or as, a, as you know, somebody that's in a, in a higher power position. And so there's a task there for, for perhaps what I would call mental management 
or mind management. And again, the more we know our own story, the quicker we can spot that and say, OK, hang on a minute, that's my stuff. Just pop that. You, you just sit over there for a minute. I need to just kind of be listening. I need to stay here, not go up here and try to cross-reference against everything, everything that I know. And then if you add in that other layer, which is, you know, I work as a, a psychologist as well. And so, you know, naturally those decades of training mm -hmm. kind of like <laughs> come up into the mind space. And what I've been working with in, in my kind of therapy work is how do I listen without problem solving? How do I listen without sort of preemptively diagnosing? How do I stay in that openness, you know, even though there might be parts of mine going, okay, this person needs this, this person needs this, I need to do this, I need to do this, or, oh gosh, that looks a bit like depression or anxiety. <laughs> so it's like, how do we keep that space clean in the listening process? And I mean, for me, kind of mindfulness practice, meditation practice has, has been essential for that because I'm able to sort of spot it arising more quickly and, and mostly able to deal with it, but not always. It's, some of it is so unconscious and so ingrained. But we have this language of, can we listen with beginner's mind yes. or listen like a child would? It's not getting rid of all of our expertise, but it's just parking it to stay in with that openness and, and connection for as long as possible. Julie, does that resonate with your work, with yourself or others yeah, I in think a writer's so. room? Um, no, I was thinking um, this thing of like meeting someone very different on, uh, and also speaking about language. I think that uh, essentially, at least the way I'm working with, uh, with cinema, it's, it's that it's about emotions and it's about character. And I think in this way of like uh, connecting with what someone coming with a different story, it can be through emotions. And, uh, and also working with like long running uh, like TV shows, it has the potential to follow a character for a long time and get under this person's skin. So I see it as a good challenge to be able to introduce people who, who um, come with new stories and kind of like force the viewer, that sounds wrong, but like to spend time with these people because eventually you will hopefully get under their skin. And I think also, uh, in that way, the language of cinema, like the more classical way of telling a story and using tricks like uh, cliffhangers and suspense, can be useful to, to a bit manipulate the viewer, but in a good way to, um, to be engaged with someone that you sh normally they wouldn't be engaged with. I would, I would find it very difficult to, to be a journalist or write articles about these stories that I want to tell in fiction and engage someone in it. Um, because uh, maybe also this aspect of moralizing it that I think really has to not be a part of art when you're making it. It's, you have to like not judge the character, you have not to see it from the different perspective. So of course it's an exercise for me when I'm writing, but hopefully also for the people I write for, like to see things from different angles. And I think in that way, for me it's very satisfying to work with long running format because you can really explore different perspectives on something. And that's very much like the projects I'm doing now is, is uh, an exercise in that, if that makes sense. Yes. Mm. I was thinking about not only the way I listen, mm -hmm. me as author, as a screenwriter, uh, but also many times we ask how my character speak what are the words of my character. But it's not often to think how my character listen, mm -hmm. what my character is able to listen, what he can hear. That's uh, a first question. And the second question is very interesting, is that moment where 
you will be a story. Mm. You need be a story because everybody is waiting for you, your story. You must be a story and you will be judged by the story you are. Yeah. A story is a, a, each kind of story, I think, uh, is a, a sort of a, a architecture, a new architect, architecture of time, mm. uh, a sort of blockage of time, a suspension of time. Even uh, uh, the uh, series uh, you, you prepare give another time. And it is important because uh, uh, if you consider that even therapeutic rituals operate with the same logic, blocking the time, and this is interesting. Why? Because in this block time, people can imagine another experience, project, uh, wait for uh, another story. So, uh, this uh, way of uh, working with time is the secret of each successful therapy, uh, the secret of each successful story, uh, narrative, it's so on. And uh, the observation made by uh, Nicholas concerning uh, uh, the fact that uh, it is rare give uh, to our character the possibility of be listening, listened by, uh, by the, the, the writer, the author. It's very uh, important because uh, if you want, I consider that uh, we uh, are not always prepared uh, to uh, reimagine our uh, roles. Mm -hmm. uh, this rigidity uh, does allow people to change, to modify. What I am suggesting is that uh, a successful story uh, is a story able to produce a little metamorphosis, mm -hmm. metamorphosis of roles, metamorphosis of emotions, metamorphosis in my body. And here the, 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 the discourse, the analysis came back to the choice of words. I have to, to make a choice. I, I have words, but I have to use words able to enter the body of people and make them sensitive to another world. I think that this is an important road for our uh, uh, analysis of our dialogue. Well, I would directly ask then, in your different practices, how do you bring this about, this metamorphosis, this passage from chaos or fragment or whatever to words or, and as you were saying also, Tamara, um, Oh, is it through a movement? I mean, is it even through something fundamentally uh, linguistic, or, or is it on a deeper, even on a deeper level, that this can s happen? But I would like to ask you how you do that in your practices. Yeah, I think the body for me is always a teacher and a tool, uh, and especially important when words are hard to find which may be for a variety of reasons. And for me, there's a, an interesting practice, which is really tuning in to the intention to make a movement and trying to observe how that decision, which is made by our frontal lobe, starts to then prepare the body, that thing that the brain does, which is bringing up past experiences and coding all the information for how to make the movement before then sending the movement out into the body. Now, in some activities, sports and martial arts is one of them, we want to get that really fine-tuned and really consistent but you can play with the opposite of that, which is how can I make a movement that I've never made before? How can I, and it's actually much harder than you think, <laughs> uh, and what you're actually 
activating at the brain level is, is something that the neuroscientists refer to as free won't. So it's not about free will. It's about the letting go to create the space mm. for the potentiality, which is much, much harder, much, much harder to do. So think of a baby, you know, how they begin to explore the world. You know, they haven't yet got the movement of walking. So they're trying every different adaptation of foot placement and angle and hip and head you know, super focused concentration. And, and slowly that becomes honed into an automatic movement that can be made without awareness. But can we as adults practice walking as if walking for the first time? <coughs> Intention, attention, awareness, sensing the world, mindful walking, some might call that, mm. of, of those practices which you also do in groups. So that's also something we wanted to discuss. Well, that, and, yeah, I, I'll speak to that quickly and yeah. we can come back to it. But that, that also came to my mind is when, when we meet somebody that our brain is like, I got no reference for this. <laughs> I got no reference for this. I'm like really stuck and I'm gonna just fill it with all my preconceptions and prejudices <laughs> because I've got, I got nothing. Those for me are movement, moments when moving together, I mean, it doesn't have to be Tai Chi, but Tai Chi is wonderful to do together. But even if it's just a simple, you know, following, mirroring, you know, we're activating the brain's mirror neurons, part of that network, social network of, of empathy and bonding. You, you, you want to add something, yeah, from... But we see that with mums and babies, right? It's all about the mirroring to create that sense of bonding and togetherness and belonging. And you can do a lot of that non-verbally, moving together. Roberto? Yeah, In your... many, many answers to your many questions. <laughs> uh, first one, very shortly. Uh, first, unfreeze words. Mm. Uh, that trivialize words. Mm -hmm. If you consider the, the first name, stay about your first name and make the story about your first name. I cannot speak about this, but with this first name, I worked three weeks with my interlocutors in West Africa because we were touching very dangerous history. All of them hid, hidden in his first name. So you touch the first name, you touch a secret, you touch a danger, you touch a rule, a story of a village. Just to give an example, they trivialize words, names. Second, working by metaphors means that you create an imaginative code. And this is uh, obvious because metaphors are able to connect. So the answer is connecting, making bridges between times and places. And we know that the places have memories, but usually we speak about our body, our individuality, and we forget the relationship between my body and the spaces and the places that we touched before. So this uh, uh, moment is in our work as researchers, as clinicians, very important. I just give you uh, an example uh, because I was speaking with a woman coming from uh, DRC, uh, Lake Victoria, La sorry, Lake Goma, and she was blocked because she was raped near the lake. And when I told her, I know this lake, I know this town. In that town, you prepare a very good fish. She smiled and she started again to reimagine a possibility for her body to, living, to live in this world, even if this world is a world of violence, death, humiliation. So it is an, 
a continuing work where we are ignorant. We have to discover step by step with the other people where plus themselves, where plus ourselves in this movement. And uh, I think that I, I told before in my first words, uh, not only languages, but even become sensitive to signs, mm. not only words, signs, and uh, multiply uh, a semiotic orientation. I think that when uh, uh, people prepare a scenario for TV, for cinema, multiply these signs because they don't want give uh, to people a complete story. They give the possibility of identify themselves in this forest of signs. How do you find your way in the, in the forest of signs and this necessity to continually connect, reconnect, um, replace in a greater, richer um, body Re of experience? Recreate a world. Yeah, recreate a world. Is that, does that echo, resonate with your yeah, practice? Yeah, totally. Um, I think uh, the reason that I, I got into what I, I love about working with, uh, with cinema is that it's a collaborative work. No one does it by themselves. And it resonates a bit with what you said also. Um, to, it, you don't start with a vision. You start with a vision, but it will be challenged by so many people in the process. And um, I think it's extremely important, obviously, to be open to that because it's such a you know, it's such a long process from the idea to the finished work and even, of course, uh, in the, in, when you are like finishing sound even, you will still be recreating the narrative of the story. Actually, I think one of the most pleasurable things is editing because for a writer, you re, with the editor, if you're working with them, which you often do on a show, you are reconstructing your story. Uh, with new uh, limit, limitations because you already shot it, you have the material, but it's like a, new, a completely different way of creativity and you learn so much about writing also from it. Um, but it's your collaborators uh, and your relationship with them that makes the work in the end. So the collaborative aspect of it is, is yeah, it's the most important aspect, I would say. Maybe you can also tell us, because um, when we were preparing this um, meeting, we spoke together about um, pleasure or joy or uh, a certain type of appreci appreciation of a series or and what you called um, addiction like a, a, a junkies attachment to a product uh, a, a series or something and we were wondering if if addiction and, and you can tell isn't a form of of trauma and we wanted to, at some point, for the conversation to center around this question of trauma. Uh, trauma in storytelling, trauma in receiving stories. Are we drug dealers or are we providers of another mm -hmm. yeah. spectrum of substances? Yeah, that's kind of the paradox. paradox or yeah. I'm asking myself that too. Um, because I think, like, um, I was reading now, I forgot the title, but an essay of David Foster Wallace about television. So I think, I guess it was written in the 90s, where television was something else than today. And maybe you could more distingu distinguish uh, things as being, I don't know, the judgmental word to say low culture. And I think now it has become less transparent, like uh, there was the golden age of television and these quality shows like The Wire and The Sopranos, and I like these shows, they were made and and so um, it became maybe a bit more difficult to distinguish what was high or low culture, or it became more acceptable to be like, or it is still now, I'm binging a tele, like I'm gonna spend my whole weekend uh, watching The Wire because it's intellectual, but what impact does it actually have on us to consume that much and and why do we need it? Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe it is like a bit like being a drug dealer. Uh, how how, yeah. for instance, how <laughs> do you sense. approach a traumatic scene or a scene depicting a trauma or the telling or retelling of a trauma? Or 
How do you go about it? And what kinds of questions do you ask yourself? Yeah, yeah it is, it's extremely difficult. I made a whole television show about uh, a rape uh, and a girl being raped and and the main character was her best friend. I think one of the ways of me to find it like, I guess, okay to tell the story is uh, that it was from the perspective of her friend and some perspectives that I could understand. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's a dilemma always. It's like you want to tell this story, but how to tell it in a respectful way, but also when you're in, in the middle of the process because, uh, you, I don't think you you think that much about it. So it's it's like before and after you're reflecting upon like is this morally <laughs> okay to yes. do? And the same times you want these stories to be told. So obviously research is a part of it. Talking to people who have lived through it or having them as part of of of, of the of the um, group to tell the story. Yeah, and how do you how do you tell it in the in the best way? Roberto. Would you like to comment on how do you relate to trauma in your own work? Uh, as you can uh, imagine, trauma is uh, the real world in clinical work. And the first thing to, to do in many cases is uh, uh, not celebrating this world because it is uh, today a sort of a, <laughs> yes, yeah. it is very. Each thing is traumatic, yeah. and uh, we risk to trivialize an important concept first. Second, uh, I repeat, in many cases we are not ready to listen traumatic experience coming from other countries, from other regions of the world. A colleague of mine uh, coming from Africa said, you European, you Westerners, you are not ready for our trauma. And I think he was right. Because what happens in many parts of the world, we just translate in our categories. So we, <laughs> we wash them, we translate in medical terms, but the problem remains invisible. Third, I think that uh, trauma doesn't need to be uh, to be said, to be made explicit. Uh, this is an important issue uh, because uh, living uh, under the empire of uh, narrative paradigm in our society, we think that we have to say all things. It is not necessary. The clinical work, the the, the very fine research is to be placed nice to things, nice to experience, not necessarily explicit them, cutting them. This is a, a surgery work, not psychological, psychotherapeutic work. What is important is communica communicating to other people that we are there, ready yeah. to listen ready to help, but it is not necessary remembering each scene, each word, each time. Tomorrow. Yes. The, the theme that's kind of bubbling for me listening to this is um, we've, we've talked about kind of the language of, of safety, yes. whether that's safety for the characters and the performers even mm -hmm. of, a, of a show or a, or a film, um, what's safe enough to expose people to Children. Um, through, through a work of art or through storytelling. And then I'm kind of thinking about, you know, what, it, what is it that happens in, in the brain when there's either a feeling of safety or lack of safety? How much stretch is enough? Mm. And maybe something in our modern world, which is because we've just been bombarding our brains with fear for kind of decades, it feels like, and recognizing that the fear experienced in the Congo Republic yeah, may be yeah. different from the fear experienced by someone walking down the streets of New York, but the fear is the fear in the brain. It's a very particular c constellation of, of neural networks that will activate in certain ways when cortisol is 
is flooding the brain. But in, you know, in the trauma work that, that I've been involved in, you know, that first contact is about co-regulation, which is, I, I can feel safe with you. How do we create safe enough spaces and containers that can allow us then to stretch a little bit more the brain salience network, which is also the networks that's for like, I didn't know that. This is new. This is novel. This is a bit, it's a bit, oh, right? The salience network is activated when it's like, oh, or it could be like, oh, or it could be like, oh, right? I mean, it's got different tones to it. And there's maybe some nuance there. Like if we want to, open awareness, you know, it doesn't have to be that big fist of shocking violence and gore, the more, the more implicit, the more subtle, but it's something that just makes your brain, and then look at the body, right, the body is like, oh, can I, can I get the little bit of a shock, but the shock that makes me lean in, rather than the shock that makes me lean out because then I'm with you, rather than just getting some buzz about having like a buzzy experience of somebody else's fear. I can be with you in it. Sorry, that was a bit rambly, but... No, <laughs> yeah. You talk about this metamorphosis of the successful story. How can you approach that sensation, you? How some uh, fiction narratives make you this uh, metamorphosis, how operate it with movies, films, how you feel it, how... You recognize it. Yeah. Where is placed this meta metamorphosis? What I can say uh, about my uh, direct experience with people, the first metamorphosis, uh, uh, an effective story, has to realize is uh, reconnecting the individual, the people, to someone else. Recreating a minimum of <coughs> shared memory and link. If the uh, healer, if the clinician, uh, he is the only one, it is just important to reimagine a micro community between me and you, you are alone, you are disrupted by the, the, your experience, but you and me, we are recreating the first minimal exchange and reintegration. And step by step, this reintegration is the metamorphosis, being again in a possible world, against the end of the world against the risk of apocalypse. This is very important today because all of us know the, the anxiety of untrust. People, migrants came here and they are object of suspicion and reciprocally they untrust our world. How you can heal these people if you are not able to reconstruct a minimum of community this reintegration is the first step of a metamorphosis. Maybe we could now turn to Mathilde, um, and who works with the first and most fundamental of <laughs> metamorphosis. Um, and maybe you can tell us in French um, how all of this resonates with your work. An experience. Oui. Euh, merci beaucoup. <rire> euh, donc, ce que vous m'aviez demandé, c'est de dire si euh, ce que j'entendais pouvait rencontrer mon quotidien ou si ça ne rencontrait pas. <rire> Et j'ai pris beaucoup de notes, ça rencontre beaucoup. <rire> euh, parce que je crois que donc, dans notre travail, euh, mon travail de sage-femme. Euh, plus, comment dire, initial, accompagner euh, des femmes enceintes à devenir mères, euh, des couples à devenir parents, et puis le travail de sage-femme qui, 
qui est aussi accompagner des femmes sur leur santé, au sens large, en dehors de la grossesse. Et puis accompagner des femmes victimes de violences, euh, euh, comment dire, sans être jamais seule, euh, avec une équipe autour de, de la femme, euh, une équipe qui se complète, une équipe qui, qui peut euh, la soutenir dans sa santé, la soutenir dans l'accès à ses droits, à ses droits juridiques, à ses droits sociaux, euh, l'accompagner aussi pour euh, recréer du lien avec d'autres personnes, au-delà de nous, l'équipe de professionnels, recréer du lien avec parfois d'autres femmes qui euh, ont vécu la, la même chose qu'elle et avec lesquelles il va pouvoir y avoir de la euh, reconnaissance mutuelle. Elles, pour le dire simplement, elles vont, elles vont se sentir comprises. Et, euh, et, et dans cette expérience du collectif aussi, elles vont s'identifier positivement à d'autres femmes en disant, euh, cette femme là-bas, de l'autre côté de la table ou euh, de l'autre côté du tatami, parce que par exemple, on fait des, des ateliers de karaté adaptés aux femmes victimes de violences, eh bien, elle est incroyable, elle est formidable et elle a vécu la même chose que moi. Sous-entendu... Ça veut dire que moi, si j'ai vécu ça, ça ne veut pas forcément dire que je suis rien du tout, que je suis nulle, que je suis en dessous du caniveau comme l'agresseur ou les situations de violence ont pu me laisser penser. Et donc, l'idée, notre, notre idée, ce qu'on essaye de faire, c'est euh, à partir de, cette, ce, de, euh, comment dire, de ce qu'on on essaye de recréer un lien, euh, c'est d'accueillir les corps des femmes qui souffrent, qui, euh, qui ont honte, parce que la honte que, de la violence qu'elles ont subie, c'est elles qui la portent. C'est très peu souvent l'agresseur, les agresseurs, ou le système qui fait autant de mal euh, que ce qu'on peut voir. Et aussi des corps qui sont endormis, dissociés, qui sont vraiment des femmes qui sont à côté de leur corps. Euh, et, euh, et du coup, on essaye de, de, de faire ça en, avec cette... Euh, comme une chaîne de sécurité et de confiance. Et ce qui est... Euh, donc, tout ce que vous avez dit, voilà, on, aussi en, en se co-régulant plein de fois en consultation, quand j'entends des récits, je me mets à souffler, un peu spontanément, comme ça. Ou quand la dame, elle pleure, parce que euh, moi, ça ne me fait pas rien. <rire> ça me fait quelque chose, plutôt, pour le dire euh, positivement. Euh, et puis, parce qu'on entend beaucoup de violences interpersonnelles, mais aussi beaucoup de violences systémiques. Euh, euh, du, du, le, les violences systémiques c'est le non-accueil des personnes exilées qui fuient comme nous aurions fui ce qu'elles fuient enfin, je veux dire, si on avait vécu ce qu'elles vivent on, on aurait aussi euh, choisi probablement de partir en tout cas si on avait leur courage euh, mais aussi des femmes qui euh, sont nées ici mais qui subissent de la violence du système euh, qui ne protège pas correctement les, les femmes victimes de violence, les personnes victimes de violence, les enfants victimes de violence et donc euh, ça nous fait vivre plein d'émotions parfois aussi avec elles, de la colère euh, de l'indignation euh, et, et c'est pas grave c'est même positif parce que euh, parfois certaines femmes moi j'aime ai, bien dire pour former les collègues soignants qu'elles elles ont besoin d'être réanimées réanimées euh, sur le plan médical, social, juridiquement, et elles ont besoin qu'on ait un peu d'élan pour elles au départ, parce que euh, quand on subit tout ça, c'est tellement sidérant, on ne, on ne peut pas y croire, le trauma c'est quelque chose qui, qui effracte notre représentation du monde, qui n'a aucun sens, c'est pour ça que c'est violent, c'est que ça n'a pas de sens, ça ne devrait pas arriver à un être humain. Et donc on peut voir des femmes comme ça, euh, sans, presque sans vie, alors que bien sûr elles sont vivantes, pourtant elles sont debout devant nous, euh, elles continuent plein, plein de fois à gérer leur vie quotidienne, à, à faire face, mais il y a quand même quelque chose de très, de très éteint, et donc elles ont besoin qu'on ait cet, cet élan-là, et on essaye de faire tout ça, en tant que professionnel de la santé, professionnel du travail social, juriste, dans un système qui ne fonctionne pas bien. Et dans un système qui nous maltraite aussi, nous. Qui fait que, en tant que professionnel du soin, par exemple, on peut nous aussi être déconnecté de notre corps, on peut nous aussi abandonner notre corps, abandonner notre sommeil, notre santé. Et c'est ça, parfois, qui est très, comment dire, une grosse contradiction, parce que Plein de fois, on partage ça avec des collègues, les femmes racontent des choses et on se dit « Ah ouais, moi aussi un petit peu ». Alors évidemment, euh, tout est relatif. Moi, je sais où dormir le soir, je sais que, comment je vais manger, euh, je sais que mes enfants sont en sécurité. Donc c'est pas euh, bah, du tout, je veux dire, c'est euh, elle, c'est puissance 10 000, hein, cette insécurité. Euh, 
Euh, et, et, et pour autant, parfois, euh, la, la violence aussi, c'est subir des injonctions très contradictoires. Hein, euh, il faut t'insérer en France, il faut savoir parler français, mais les cours euh, de français, ils sont remplis. <rire> il faut euh, pouvoir euh, euh, être un exilé utile, avoir plein de, de, de connaissances, être, être utile à la société, mais quand je suis demandeur d'asile, je ne peux pas travailler, c'est interdit. Je peux faire du bénévolat, j'ai le droit. Euh, et et bah, nous aussi, les soignants, on a des injonctions contradictoires. Hein. On nous dit que c'est important de bien se former pour bien accueillir les femmes victimes de violences, les enfants victimes de violence, mais on nous demande de le faire sans augmenter les budgets, par exemple. Alors qu'il y, y a aussi toutes les autres problématiques à accompagner. Et donc, c'est ça un petit peu cette... Euh, euh, comment dire... Euh, ce, ce gros paradoxe qui fait que... Euh, bah, au final, on, on fait comme on peut, du mieux qu'on peut, on, on, avec beaucoup d'engagement, je crois, parce qu'elles nous obligent, ces femmes, avec leur... Euh, leur euh, résistance. L'être humain a des capacités d'adaptation extraordinaires et, et tous les jours, on voit des personnes qui résistent, euh, qui tiennent debout, parfois on ne sait même pas comment. Et donc, bien sûr qu'elles elle nous obligent. On, à la fois, j'entendais, on est dans une époque du désespoir, mais ces consultations et la co-animation des groupes de parole ou même des ateliers thérapeutiques avec, on a dit, le karaté, mais ça peut être le théâtre, l'art-thérapie, la danse. Il y a aussi plein de moments incroyables très positif, de joie, de rire. Parfois, on se marre en consultation parce qu'elle raconte un truc horrible et là, hop, elle fait une petite note d'humour. On se dit, waouh Et en plus, vous avez gardé le sens de l'humour parce que en fait, c'est l'élan de vie. Il faut rester en vie malgré ce qu'on a vécu et c'est aussi ça qui fait que la violence ne gagnera pas. C'est qu'en en fait, ça ne l'a pas complètement tué et elle garde ça. Et donc... Euh, et donc voilà, euh, je ne sais pas si nous, on est des poètes, euh, mais en tout cas, ce qui est sûr, c'est que quand on leur donne les moyens de se raconter, d'une façon ou d'une autre, euh, quand on essaye de les écouter et de ne pas être euh, des professionnels de santé qui font que des prescriptions ou euh, des juristes qui donnent que des conseils, mais d'abord, avant tout, vraiment écouter, donc on se forme à poser des questions plutôt ouvertes, euh, plutôt de dire comment ça va, plutôt de que de dire ça va bien madame aujourd'hui <rire> Voilà, par exemple, tout simple. Hein, mais, euh, et et bah, elles, en tout cas, elles se saisissent. Euh, et, et donc c'est vraiment ça. Ce n'est pas la parole des personnes victimes de violences qui se libèrent, c'est notre capacité d'écoute qui progressivement grandit. Mais plus on aura des, un système cohérent, qui fonctionne bien, qui sécurise vraiment, plus on pourra écouter. Parce que c'est extrêmement violent d'écouter, d'entendre et de dire « Ah oui, mais ça ne marche pas hyper bien les mises en sécurité. Il n'y a plus trop de place à l'hôtel pour les mises en sécurité. Ou alors il y a une place, mais il y a, il y a beaucoup de cafards dans la chambre pour vous mettre en sécurité. » voyez, Ça donne plutôt envie de boucher les oreilles quand on n'a pas de solution derrière. Mais donc, des solutions euh, existent. Euh, par la maison des femmes, Gisèle Halimi vient d'ouvrir à Rennes. Euh, euh, il, elle n'existait pas il y a trois mois. Donc, même si on trouve qu'elle n'est pas aussi euh, incroyable qu'on l'a rêvé, elle existe et on va... Euh, comment dire, euh, avec notre engagement collectif, euh, personne ne fait ça seul, on va s'efforcer à ce qu'elle soit de plus en plus formidable et de plus en plus comme on l'a rêvé. Euh, et, euh, et voilà, et, et essayer d'être à la hauteur de leur euh, capacité d'adaptation, pour nous aussi avoir cette capacité d'adaptation dans un monde qui ne tourne pas vraiment rond, euh, mais où il y a encore, euh, j'imagine, enfin j'espère, sinon je ne peux plus travailler, des raisons d'espérer. Des, des raisons et, et avant tout, elles, ces femmes, elles, elles, elles sont, leurs enfants aussi, et leurs, euh, je parle beaucoup de femmes, mais leurs alliés, les hommes alliés, enfin, qui ne sont pas violents et qui les soutiennent aussi. Tous ces êtres humains-là sont des raisons d'espérer. J'ai une question, juste une petite question, sur votre travail comme midwife, et de livrer des bébés, et de préparer pour ce moment qui vient et tout ça. About when does a story begin for you and, and in your practice? When does one start to have a story? Um, pour moi, la parole, elle est, euh, comment dire, euh, elle est. Euh, si les femmes ne me font pas confiance et qu'il n'y a pas de parole, je suis au chômage technique. Je ne peux pas travailler. Mais la parole, ça peut être euh, le corps qui fait, parce que parfois, elles ne peuvent pas le dire avec les mots. Donc, le, le récit, il commence quand on se dit bonjour. 
et ils commencent quand euh, elles, elles se comportent, euh, parce que parfois elles, elles peuvent être vraiment très renfermées. Enfin, quand il y a le début d'une expression, à ce moment-là, le, le récit commence. Et quand j'entendais le mot, euh, des, euh, quand est-ce que ça commence, beginning, euh, c'est aussi, euh, comment dire, certaines femmes qui disent, avec ce bébé, euh, je veux recommencer à zéro. Je, ce que j'ai accepté jusqu'à présent, maintenant, c'est fini. Puis il y a vraiment souvent le corps qui parle comme ça. C'est pour moi, puisqu'elle se considère comme très peu de valeur, euh, j'acceptais, mais pour ce bébé. Et donc là, on voit un nouveau récit. Et pourtant, et c'est pour ça que c'est génial d'être sage-femme et, et que c'est génial la, la, la période périnatale parce que euh, on sait que les, les traumas, les histoires de violence euh, elles peuvent se répéter comme ça de génération en génération. Et euh, j'ai noté un mot, le mot bifurquer, on a parlé de ça. Nous, ce qu'on essaye de faire avec cette qualité du lien qu'on essaye de leur faire vivre, à, en essayant de leur euh, donner euh, comment dire, la sensation qu'elles qu méritent d'être bien traitées, c'est qu'elles bifurquent vec, vers un chemin de sécurité et qu'elles débutent un, un, peut-être un nouveau récit, ça, ça n'efface rien de ce qu'elles ont vécu, hein, ce qu'elles ont subi, mais euh, d'enclencher de, de, comme ça une nouvelle, euh, une nouvelle façon d'entrer en relation avec les autres, avec du pouvoir d'agir, sans, sans soumission, sans, sans être dominé, euh, sans être abandonné aussi, c'est pour ça qu'il faut qu'on soit à la hauteur. Donc le récit à la fois, il commence bah, dès qu'on se rencontre, euh, parfois, elles ne parlent pas parce qu'elles ont mal quand elles arrivent en salle d'accouchement en, en travail. Euh, et puis, on, il ne faut pas trop qu'on parle non plus parce que ça les saoule. Elles veulent juste qu'on les aide comme elles ont envie, quand, comme elles ont besoin. Euh, donc là, le récit commence et parfois, il peut recommencer un petit peu sous nos yeux. Mais il faut être patient. On ne voit pas toujours le, le fruit de notre, nos efforts relationnels payés tout de suite. C'est comme si tu sèmes une graine. Euh, et puis parfois elle, elle germe direct parce que le terreau était prêt puis parfois non, tu prépares juste le terreau et c'est un collègue un jour ou un amoureux gentil ou une, ou une amie ou un groupe de pères autour d'elle qui vont faire euh, semer la graine et puis après c'est elle euh, la jardinière principale hein. nous on est juste là pour aider à travailler quoi. Mais... Just two things about your uh, uh, last remark Our effort is Uh, toward people humiliated, uh, the effort of making epic story about their miserable story. You are not just a victim, you are not just an ill people, you are not just a disparate man. We have to transform in epic sense is our trajectory. Each therapy has to realize this metamorphosis. Your trajectory is not the trajectory of the last, but it is a brave, heroic history, and we can struggle together. Second thing, and I hand, introducing uh, with these bodies humiliated, blessed, shameful, a word of grace. And I think that you were speaking about this, a graceful experience, a grace time, finally, again, smiling, uh, joking, a grace, a time of grace. When this happens, we are uh, healing, we are effective by our words, because these people are without grace. They arrive without any grace. We have to introduce this little miracle in our stories. Tamara, I think you, I believe you must disagree uh, deeply with what <laughs> Roberto just expressed. <laughs> no, not at all, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> the, the words that just came to me was something about the, it's, in, it's in the micro. Yeah. It's in the micro moments of connection. It's in the micro moments of a smile or a a gesture or a touch, you know, in the screen writing too, you know, it's that little thing that maybe half the audience missed, but there was that little clue that something shifted. And, and the language of impetus, yeah. catalyst, boost. And I suppose what, what's really 
been helpful in my practice is reducing expectations. Yeah. But in the letting go of <coughs> needing to fix everything that comes maybe early in one's career as a, as a kind of therapist or a healer, you're kind of full of this grandiosity of yeah. I can save the world and I can fix everybody. But with time comes the maturity, of course, which is we can't. And we'll go mad if we try to. So what are the micro shifts and I think that question when does the story start it's it's a topic for another discussion I think <laughs> um, in terms of Matilda's work or well, I mean maybe in terms of what you just said which is is it on this fine level of the micro that you know, the, the real work is being done, or the work that will grace us. Yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely for a script writer, it's, uh, you do all this preparation, uh, you try to sell your project, you do what we call synopsis, treatment, research, but the micro, I mean, that's when you write a scene, I would say, and it yes. becomes, of course, even more detailed when you, you, you uh, shoot it, but, uh, that is obviously when you see the material come to life. It is when you start describing uh, little gestures, uh, small remarks, and, and that is um, that's why um, uh, and it's very difficult uh, in the long process where you don't get to that. Uh, you and you have to wait for many reasons because you have to be ready for that. But also, no one will finance it until they uh, feel safe about what it is you're telling. But that is actually, I mean, uh, when it comes to life. So, and still, it's a it's a work paper. So it will change again in the words of an actor who is a person who comes with his or her own story. But I, yeah, I, I definitely agree that that is where it, and where it happens, and that is where it becomes unique. Also, uh, before it's like a print of something that could be a more cliche or general thing, but it's like. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I think yes. No, I was no just reacting to what you just said. I think in the field of storytelling or screenwriting, we work on both levels. No, the big level and the small level. But we don't really maybe have we we're not taught and we don't teach as much as we could to really work on the minute, to really, really, really work on the fine, differentiated, small, subtle nuances of emotion or of, you know, uh, details in a scene, and a character. Yeah. And maybe what we're all discussing here is the care that is needed on that <coughs> fundamental level of each and every person or being in that we need to consider them at that level, at that level, and where nobody is like anybody else, and at the same time, we're all the part of the one. Well, I, and I, I get, again, I hear this thing about what's safe for audiences, what's safe for funders. I mean, oh, my heart drops, you know. And yet, what, what is maybe one of the most powerful micro gestures at the moment? It's not skillful by any means, but it's, you know, it's this capacity to whip out your phone and make one click with one finger and instantaneously share, you know, things that would never get through a, a cinema, you know, rating thing. And, and it's just all there. Now, I'm not saying that's skillful, but there's something very curious that, that's happening, I think, in our modern times with technology. You know, OK, maybe we're going too far, like everything's a story. You know, every fight on a bus in London is videoed. And, but, but there's a new type of storytelling that is just with us now. And how do we, how do we stay connected I guess to that, with its guts and glory and mess, and then it feels like almost at the other end is that sort of really subtle, nuanced, 
probably much slower, much more thoughtful way of, of showing the human experience. But we're both of those, aren't we? We're like the mess and we're the, the beauty. Roberto? Uh, just to say that we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> uh, be humble. Uh, be careful because we don't have any answer for these kind of problems. I think that uh, uh, we have to struggle against what uh, a Nigerian uh, psychiatrist uh, defined, the moral arrogance mm. of the Western knowledge. I think that we have to restart with uh, uh, a different approach. Maybe people have a solution if we are able to recognize it <laughs> together. Julie? What do you say to that? What does the screenwriter say to that? Oh, yeah, no, it sounds beautiful. I think. Um, <laughs> um, I think like um, meetings like this are extremely important to to get out of your field, talk to other fields of work because I know that uh, I tend to get stuck in my ways. And as you said, like on the micro level. Uh, it, it seems so silly that you can stay on ab an abstraction for so long that you forget something as simple as like you talk about this character for so long, he's in this way and he's in that way. But you haven't felt it, you haven't detailed it, so you stay in the abstraction for too long. So to get grounded somehow, yeah. uh, I think that is, is, and be humble, definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for this humbling grounding. <laughs> thank you. And thank you all. <laughs>